friends while you're still on your feet, turn to those nearby offering a good morning and a welcome. Yesterday I had the uh, great privilege of uh, spending an incredible day here at the church with uh, the uh, Church Librarian Association of British Columbia who held uh, an amazing conference yesterday. And um, we had, they, they had different speakers come in. Uh, Jason Biasi, who is a professor at Vancouver School of Theology, who will be preaching here this summer, um, just had these, these inspiring words that made me feel like I was on the wrong career track and should have been a librarian. <laughs> it was just amazing. And he spoke of the role of a librarian as um, being a, a little bit of a social worker. Um, that the role of a church librarian was to know if someone comes up to them with a book recommendation, um, that their job is to know that person's soul and not to recommend it their favorite book, but to recommend the book that is just perfect for that person at that time. And I was like, wow, what a ministry. <laughs> um, so I invite all of you, when you have a chance, um, make use of our library, make use of the great resource that we have here. And uh, I'll, I'll be inviting Donna Simon to come up and light the Christ candle in a moment. Um, but she's our church librarian. And, uh, Please go have a conversation with her. If you are in that place where you're looking for something, to, whether it's just to distract you or to take your faith uh, a little bit deeper, have a conversation with her. Um, she is just, just knows her stuff, which is what you want in a church librarian. Um, along with her lighting a Christ candle, um, I'll be inviting uh, Claire Watts and Will Huntruck, um, and in spirit, Anna Guthrie. Uh, the three of them uh, were a youth panel at the conference yesterday and talked about their passion for literature, their, uh, their enjoyment of books, and I think more importantly on the importance of building bridges um, between generations and, and how, how we can do that as a community. And um, I was just so incredibly proud of the ways that they communicated with, with passion, with insight, and um, so I'm, I'm just, I'm 
absolutely blown away with uh, just the caliber of young people that, that all of you have helped raise in this church family. Um, so I'd like to invite Donna Simon, who organized the conference, who, by the way, um, just says a big thank you um, to all of you. So many of you are very, very supportive. Um, she got great support from the board um, in, in offering the space here. And uh, so she wanted me to pass on a, a very deep and sincere thank you to all of you. So I'd like to invite Donna, Claire, and Will to come and light the Christ candle this morning.
please join with me in the gathering prayer. God, you are for us. In our struggles, you are for us. In our wanderings, you are for us. In our waverings, you are for us. Every day, continue to open our eyes to your presence around us. Help us go beyond belief, claiming for ourselves our place in your story. God, you are for us, and for that we thank you. With all of who we are, we continue to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. to invite the children present forward for our introduction to Sunday Club. ago. Yeah? Okay, so you, you all remember the story. Matthew had a broken leg. Well, Jacob, his brother, do you want to put your arm up for a second? <laughs> so Jacob just broke his arm. Someone get this family some milk. <laughs> Are you feeling all right, buddy? Just tired, eh? And how did, how did it happen? Oh, he was scootering off of a jump, and then the jump moved. I hate that. <laughs> That's the worst. Yep. Oh, 
which which video? Oh, his, yeah. There's no video evidence, is there? Okay, that's good. That's good. All right. Um, I'm going to send you guys off. Um, just before that, I'll pray, and uh, for the rest of the congregation, uh, with the younger group and Dylan's group, they'll be uh, talking about the the story with the open tomb and um, Debbie Simpson, uh, who will be with the older group this morning because I'm here um, teaching your parents. Uh, <laughs> uh, Debbie Simpson will be you'll be starting to work through the book of Luke. We've been looking at the book of Mark and. Um, you guys will be looking with at the book of Luke with Debbie. All right. Um, so before you head off, let me just pray for you. And I hope you have a, a really great morning with uh, Debbie and Dylan. Let's pray. Um, God, I just I thank you so much for uh, the young lives that you entrust us as a community with. And God, um, as uh, Claire, Will, and Anna talked about yesterday, the, the importance of... Uh, building relationships with people of all ages uh, is a gift that is so unique to the church. And God, I just ask that you would continue to give us the creativity um, to find ways to connect with one, an with one another, uh, whether we're four years old or 84 years old. And God, as, uh, they, as the kids head out, may you continue to guide all of us and continue to teach all of us. We pray all of this in Jesus' awesome and holy name. Amen. All right, off you go. sustainer. We, your Easter people, along with the psalmist, ask, what is man that you are mindful of him, giving us the Easter gift of the empty tomb? Along with the frightened women disciples at the tomb, the disciples huddled in the upper room, those walking along the road to Emmaus, or Thomas, hastening to join the other disciples, we bring our varied and mixed reactions of joy, anticipation of a new vision of life, and our disbelief and our doubts that the resurrection of Jesus has happened. Help us to use our varied reactions to strengthen our faith, knowing the assurance that Thomas received from Jesus, and Jesus promised that we who accept by faith will indeed be blessed, so we may live our life in accordance with his plan. In the midst of this, our turbulent world, we ask that your presence be felt in the wars of the Middle East. Help those who have the political power consider the plight of the people who are displaced and hopeless. Enable them to work to make a lasting peace. We pray today for our fellow Christians, particularly in Pakistan, who face danger and anger for their faith. Help the refugees, wherever they are, to find a hope for the future for their families, so bitterness will not take root in their lives, spreading misery. Help those myriads of volunteers who help the refugees not to lose heart and to continue their vital support as this humanitarian crisis continues. We ask that we too are not caught into closed-mindedness and think of retribution rather than trying to find root causes of the violence besetting our world. We pray for our governments, federal, provincial, and local, that they too will choose not just an expedient way, but a way to enhance our communities to be an inclusive and just society. Help us as a church to make our presence felt in the midst of our community, modeling our beliefs in action, finding ways to embrace the stranger, 
so they feel they may have a home and a family here with us. Bless those who continue the important work of supporting the refugee families in coming to Canada and helping them with the difficult task of creating a new life. We ask that your presence be especially felt in the coming week by those who mourn, those who face the many losses and difficulties that we are prey to, health, security, friendship, work. We remember those in need known to us in silence, in our thoughts. And in this congregation we pray for Michael, John, Randy, Barbara, Brad, Janice, Milena, Alistair, and Judy. We ask all of this in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer God. Amen. Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter, 
I was particularly uh, thankful for the gift of the Flower Committee and all those that joined in that group to bring the, the visual alive for us uh, as we moved through that very special week, taking fabrics, taking imagery such as the, the cross, which has begun to recede again already uh, from the stories. It made, started in the, in the corner and it took front and center place Good Friday and then has begun its retreat. And there has just been such rich uh, imagery for our eyes to take in, uh, including the uh, uh, brightly colored cloth that appeared last uh, week on Easter, hanging from the cross, reminding us of the grave clothes that have been set aside, but not just plain white grave clothes, excuse me, but the color of celebration, the golds and the blues of Easter that remind us that that life has been set loose from the empty tomb. Uh, that's what our gifts are designed to do. They are designed to be set loose as Easter people that they uh, move about the world touching lives, offering new life and new hope. And so, let our offerings be received.
as we prepare to hear God's word, let us pray. Gracious God, you speak to us in so many ways. In the song of a bird, in the babbling of a brook, in the voices of our friends, in the stillness of the night, and in the stories of the Bible. Speak to us now through the reading of scripture. Help us to hear your voice and follow the way of Jesus. Amen. The reading today is John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. Jesus appears for the first time to his disciples. When it was evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples <coughs> had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Jesus and Thomas. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger <coughs> in the mark of his nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The purpose of this book. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing, you may have life after his name. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Be to God.
love watching you do what you love. <laughs> I think you love it. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I was in Montreal this past week, and uh, actually much to my dismay, I, as I was getting pictures from uh, Megan about the beautiful warm weather here, and uh, it was cold and rainy there. And uh, I was there to help plan. Uh, the United Church of Canada has a, a big youth conference that happens every three years. that gathers uh, young people from high school to university ages all across Canada. And uh, I helped plan the last one that happened in Winnipeg. And the next one in August 2017 is uh, happening in Montreal. And so I was in Montreal to help plan this conference. And... Um, Adding to my chagrin of having to uh, walk around or having to be not in this beautiful weather was that we had to look at venues um, across the city, which involved us walking through the rain. Now, you'd think I'm from Vancouver and uh, I'd be used to it. Um, apparently, I'm not. I need a few more years to be in Vancouver. But this is, this is what happened one night. Um, I was thinking about this sermon coming up, trying to, uh, trying to figure out what angle do I want to take with this scripture passage. And I went to bed, and I had the most incredible dream. I dreamt that on my flight back, I sat in my seat, and there was a man next to me. And I turned to this man and asked him his understanding of God. And we started talking about doubt, started talking about faith. And I just woke up that morning knowing that when the time comes, this man will give me my sermon. Now, I think there's a, a little fine print somewhere in you know, the preacher's manual that says, real ministers talk about their faith to people on airplanes. Um, I think that's just the way it's supposed to be. And, and you know, that's not, that's not me. I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, hey, tell me about Jesus. Um, maybe one day I will. But so I, I just, I got onto this airplane with this dream in mind, and I was, I was ready. And um, I sat down, and this man that actually looked like a man from my dream came and sat next to me. <laughs> and in that moment, I decided I did not want to talk to him. <laughs> and so I slept the entire flight, got off, and went home. I think that's where my unbelief comes in. So I have to talk to strangers. <laughs> Let us pray. Um, God, as we... as we gather... May your Holy Spirit continue to fill this place. My God, for the times in which we think you're speaking and we don't listen, for the times in which we see you move and we respond out of our own hesitations and fears, may you have mercy and may you continue to guide us and love us the way you do so well. We pray this in Jesus' awesome and holy name. Amen. Poor Thomas. So, who's ever done something at a family gathering? Maybe you broke the vase, and for the next 20 years, you show up, and someone's like, oh, it's the vase breaker. <laughs> this is basically what happens to Thomas. Every So, the lectionary, which is uh, a way that the church year, scripture is divided throughout three years of the church year. Um, the lectionary is divided so that we can have a sense of the majority of scripture over a period of three years. Now, um, I found out as, as I was reading, I found out that every year, the passage, the passage that we look at after Easter is Thomas. So the other stories get to rotate every three years, but poor Thomas gets ragged on every single year. Like, give him a break. So, and this is why I say, let's give him a break. Okay, listen, let's go back to the scripture passage. So, verse 24 talks about Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with uh, the other disciples when Jesus came. 
So the other disciples tell him, We have seen the Lord. But he says to them, Unless I see the marks in his hand and in his side, I will not believe. So there comes the expression, Doubt in Thomas. Okay, let's back up a paragraph. Listen to this. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked because they were afraid of the Jews. So here is a group of people who were so afraid after the resurrection that they were in a room with the doors locked. Jesus comes to them and stands amongst them and he says, Peace be with you. After he says this, he shows them his hands and his sides, and his side. Now listen to this next verse. Then, so after the disciples see his hands and his side, then the disciples rejoice and they recognize their Lord. Now why is this story not called the doubting ten other people? <laughs> Because it sounds to me like that's the starting point, is a group of disciples who were afraid and who needed to see the marks before they believed. Now, unfortunately, Thomas should have just stayed home because he shows up and they all make fun of him, say, oh, you're doubting Thomas. <laughs> that's not how I treat my friends. <laughs> So what I see in um, what I see in this passage is three different responses that we can have to Christ's resurrection. Now, when I was at camp, uh, I grew up in the Catholic Church, and I'm very, very grateful for a lot of the heritage and I think the, the deep theology that our Catholic brothers and sisters have. Um, I'm very fortunate for that inheritance. When I was 13, I wanted nothing to do with the church, walked away from the church, and it wasn't until I was 19 that I ended up at a United Church camp. And um, through this camp, there was just a specific moment. We walked into, uh, we were in this church service, and it's a moment I will never forget, but we walk into this church service, and um, I was invited to come and share my story of how I became a Christian. And I said to them, I uh, not actually a Christian. And they said, well, talk about whatever you want to talk about. Typical United Church, I think. <laughs> oh, wait, I should say that after ordination. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I got up and I started to speak about the incredible gift that I saw that these people had in their lives. They, they were Christian. Yet it was a gift that they were completely squandering. And I, I spoke to them about the gift that they had that I wish I had. And in that moment, my entire life changed. I had gotten into Western for aviation management and transferred my major to do chemical engineering. And in that moment, it felt as though God came in, grabbed me by the collar, and said, You are so done running away from me. And in that moment, there was something that I can liken to this. I, I can picture in my mind, but it's like a glowing pearl. And it felt like it was planted right inside of me. And from that moment on, I just, I just know that God is. When I was in seminary, my classmates would talk about the doubts that they had, sometimes wondering if they were in the right field and in the right career path. And I remember listening to them thinking, that's one thing that I cannot relate with. I just know that God is. And so this to me is the first response. And I think it's the response that we see in the 10 disciples. The 10 disciples are in a room. Initially, they're concerned, they doubt, but then they see Jesus. They experience Experience Jesus in an undeniable way. They know the resurrection happened. We talked about this in our theology class. Is it really possible to, when we say know 
God, God who is unknowable. And um, Janet Gere, the professor, I think nailed it exactly. And, it, and I really did because she said, in French, the word, um, the word to know, savoir, there's what we translate in English, there's only one word, but in French, there's different understandings of what to know means. And one of them is savoir, which is in line with wisdom. Um, so you cannot savoir God in the sense that God is unknowable. But the other one is connaître, to know, connaître. And connaître is relational. Connaître is all about two people. And connaître God is, I think, what the disciples came to experience in that room. Now, your second response, and I would separate knowing from believing. The second response is what Jesus points to. Jesus says to Thomas, he says, and I think Thomas comes to know the resurrection. But what Jesus says to Thomas and to the other disciples, he says to them, Blessed are they who believe without seeing. So let me leave that for a moment. I think the third response possible is to simply say, I do not want to believe. And I think Thomas points to that, is saying, I will not believe until I see. So let me illustrate this for all of us. Um, who here likes a good, warm cup of black Anyone? Okay. Great. Yeah, so some of us like it with milk. So um, Katie, uh, Katie used to work in a coffee shop. And um, through, uh, through the work that she did, I came to really appreciate coffee, um, just black coffee. And the words that she taught me was that you can really make any cup of coffee good with sugar and milk. The test of a real good cup of coffee is if you can drink it when it's black. And so... I started drinking probably since then, the last five years, started drinking my coffee black. And um, one, of my favorite, one of my favorite moments in, in the entire day is when I wake up. Um, one of the great things, so most of you will know, Megan and I share a house with Dylan and Katie, and Dylan does um, construction work, which means that he's up very early, which then means that Dylan has made coffee by the time I'm up. <laughs> And um, we like to buy, right now we have a little bag of coffee from East Van Roasters, which is a social enterprise in the downtown east side. Uh, those of you who've been with us for Father's Day will remember the chocolates that we give to you. It's uh, an organization that hires women from the downtown east side um, to give them marketable skills. And so uh, we have this great little pouch of coffee um, from East Van Roasters. And so this morning I woke up to this incredible aroma. Um, it was just out of this world. And we have this little French press. So it was just it was a glorious moment. So, <laughs> before I get carried away, let me just say that Dylan makes an incredible, incredible cup of coffee. So if you bear with me for one moment. <clears throat> This is my, one of my favorite mugs. I bought it in Argentina, and it's a dog smelling another dog's behind, and it says, <laughs> it says, I like you. <laughs> so, <laughs> I promise this has to do with God. So, uh, this is one, uh, Dylan just makes an incredible, incredible cup of coffee. So, Debbie, this is for you this morning. Have a sip. It may be a little hot. No. Hot. Okay, so she says, that's good. <laughs> so here we are. We can have three responses. Debbie knows that that coffee is good. She knows. Now the rest of you I wish I had coffee for all of you, but the rest of you are now in a position 
where you can choose to believe our claim, or you can choose to decide whether or not you will believe it until you've tasted it for yourself. Now what Jesus says, Jesus says, blessed are you if you believe that this cup of coffee is good without having to taste it. This is what Jesus says, and he says, he says this in, <laughs> to me in the way that makes all of life come together. So what does this mean, and let me end with this, what does this mean for us as 21st century Christians? I enjoy reading scripture, I think it's great, I think it's important, but what does it mean for us as we try to follow Jesus here on the North Shore in 2016? Well, two things. I think if you find yourself this morning in the camp where you know God, and if you find yourself believing in God, then the call is for us to go out into this world and make that known. We live in a city, the last statistic that I heard was that downtown, 61% of people live by themselves in their condos. How do we, as a community, go out into the world? We have this gift of each otherness. We have the gift of community. And so how do we share that with those 61% of people who are on their own? Now I realize a lot of us here are on our own. But look around each other. Look around you and, and look at the faces around you. You are known and you are loved. I got an email this week from an old friend. She said, can you pray for me? So this last year was the most difficult year of my life. So my husband asked for a divorce. And in that conversation said to me that he never actually believed in God. She then followed that up and said, we've been working through it but it's difficult. And can you pray for us? And so I just ask that you keep them in prayer. But what I said to her is good for your husband for being honest. And so if you find yourself this morning in the position where you, you need to taste the coffee before you can say, I, I, I believe. If you're in a place where you are wondering and you have questions, come and talk. Talk with, talk with Philip. <laughs> <laughs> Ask questions of those around you. I see it in so many faces, this vibrant hope that there is so much more to life. And so if you find yourself sitting there wondering like this, just doesn't make sense to me. Even if you've been here for 75,000 years and it still doesn't make sense to you, that is okay because we follow a God who is loving and who is gracious. And so ask questions. Talk to those around you and say, man, you seem to get it. I just, I need help. I don't. And I want to leave you with this last, last piece. I know I said that like five minutes ago, but this is actually the last piece. I want to invite you to reflect on who the Thomases are in your own lives. Now on Fridays, we send these emails out to those of you who signed up for it um, as a little bit of a preview of the upcoming Sunday. And one of the things that I wrote about this week was ways that you can prepare yourselves for this Sunday. And the last question was, who are the Thomases in your lives? 
Maybe there's someone in your condo building, or maybe there's someone at work who you know is right on the cusp, who wants to believe but simply just can't. Each one of us are here because someone took the time to invite us out. Someone shared this message with us, whether it was a mentor, whether it was a Sunday school teacher, whether it was a complete stranger on an airplane who was probably a minister. (laughs) So I invite you this week, as you go back to your homes, to think about the Thomases in your lives, the people who simply need your loving invitation to say, you know what? I am part of this incredible community of faith. We don't always get it, but why don't you come with us? That might just be the one word that person needs to hear. For them to know how good the coffee is. And so I invite us to stand and together to proclaim the Apostles' Creed, the foundation of our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
brothers and sisters, the gift of faith that you have been given is not for you. It's for those who are not yet here. I mentioned last week that there's a, it's a great quote by C.S. Lewis in which he says that the church is the only organization that exists primarily for the benefits of its non-members. And so with that, go out into the world remembering that this faith of yours is not for you. It's for those around you. And so may you go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.